Hello, everyone. The day is Thursday, November 21st, 2019. This is the week in charts. Obviously, I want to thank all you guys and girls for being here today. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to be here. I'm humbled by your presence. There's a slam screen. As you know, you can lose money trading, or as I often say, all predictions are about the future. And a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. That's actually a quote from Greg Morris. All right, what are we going to talk about? Well, the current bull market, or was that a 40 inch slip? I, I guess we're in a bull market. We're making new highs. Is the trend following more on? I should follow along. Your questions on trading, if you don't mind, keep them on the slides just so my ADD doesn't kick in. And then when we get to the live charts, feel free to ask about anything you want. And when we do get to the live charts, and hold off to them, if you don't mind, but give me your favorite stock picks. If you want me to take a look at something, be happy to do. Give you my two cents. So what we're going to talk about? Well, I want to talk about my trading mission mostly, and a little bit of my business mission too. And basically, that boils down to dreaming big, but acting small. And as I was putting this together a little while ago, and that's why I was a little late getting started, I realized that there's so many things that I want to tell you, and it dovetails in with so many other presentations that I'd never get it all in, but I at least want to get started this week. And then we're going to revisit this in coming weeks. Recently, I read Scott Adams' book, and it's entertaining and very good, and I'd recommend you read it. If you go to www.davelander.com slash books to read, you'll see that one and, and plenty of other ones. And one of the things he talked about was affirmations, and you'll notice that some of this comes from a recent random, random thoughts that I published. And I figured, okay, well, what could it hurt? So I started making some affirmations. And the first thing I started with was, I, Dave Landry, will have a slightly absurd liquid net worth in 2024. Now, the slightly absurd number, as I said in the random thoughts, was very sizable and slightly absurd, meaning that if I achieved it, I would be somewhat blown away. It's not completely a pipe dream, but it's it's a substantial amount. And the reason I'm not going public with that substantial amount, although one thing that I'm experimenting a little bit with, and that's part of today's presentation, is radical transparency, which I learned from Dalio's book. And I'll mention that a little bit towards the end of the presentation again. But... <laughs> One reason that I'm not saying the amount is I don't want any friends or relatives to track me down in 2024 for a loan. But you do have to have a specific amount in mind, as all these motivational people will tell you. And you also have to have a date and a timeline. I think if you don't have an amount and a date and a timeline, it's just a dream and everyone has that. And one of the things that I've been thinking about a lot lately, as I'm going to talk about here, is once you put some of these plans into motion and affirmations in, into motion, you begin attracting certain things. And let's see if I can find it real quick. One thing I wanted to incorporate in this presentation, and just by accident, and that's the, the, the strange thing, I don't want to go all esoteric on you or whatever, but yesterday, my wife was looking for a picture, and she said, can you go double-check in your office one more time? I said, well, I'll go dig in this box that's not unpacked, but I know it's not in there, but anyway, I went ahead and dug anyway, and I found that I had a copy of, a printed copy of The Science of Getting Rich by Waddles, and basically it says... You can't just have a longing for something or a desire to to have wealth because everybody has that. And it went on to say that you must know what you want and be specific and definite. And this is all from chapter eight. And this is something that I'll probably spend a little time on. Now, Waddles is a little out there, but I think if you are thinking in a, in a certain way that he talks about in chapter eight, then you will create some of these attractions. Now, before I digress too far, I think if you're going to have 
a lofty goal, I think that's a, a great thing. If you're gonna dream, you might as well dream big, but is there something smaller and more achievable affirmation that you could take? So I started every morning, I get up and write three pages. First thing I do every morning, big fan of doing that. Hated it at first, hated it, hated it, hated it. But after a while, I actually found myself waking up and looking forward to it. I can't wait to get my coffee ready and everything and, and grab my pen and start writing. And from these pages, a lot have come out of them. And I started writing my big affirmation every day a few times. And I got to think, it's like, okay, well, that's pretty big deal. That's a pretty long ways off. Is there something maybe a little bit smaller that might be a little bit more achievable that I can do? So I came up with, I, Dave Landry, will land this specific business deal. And I didn't put any action into place that, or write about any action that was going to help me achieve this deal. I just started saying, well, I'm gonna achieve this business deal. And every morning I'd reread that along with my big picture affirmations and sometimes write them a couple times in my morning pages. So in writing these affirmations and referring to them often, guess what happened? Nothing, absolutely nothing. But I decided, well, you know what? Let me just keep the faith. There's some mornings where I can't really think of anything to write to fill those three pages. Not that I just want to fill them with fluff. But when I reach an impasse or a, a snag and I can't think of anything, writer's block, whatever you want to call it, it's like, well, let me just write an affirmation or two. So I kept writing that big picture affirmation along with my business affirmation, the smaller business affirmation. Now, one thing I noticed is that these affirmations created actions and attractions. And one thing I began to think about during the day is, as I preached before, is this action moving me toward or away from my goal? Now, I've done complete presentations on this, and this is kind of one of those motivational things, Anthony Robbins or whoever. And whatever you're doing, just ask yourself. You need a little R&R, &R, don't get me wrong. But when you're supposed to be working or if you're not doing anything that's meaningful or whatever outside of work, is this action helping you move toward or away from your goal? Now, this little screen capture I did, we were talking about follow the fear and the greed or follow the process. And those are little things you can ask yourself. And this is part of what we'll get into more details in upcoming presentations. But little things I begin to notice more and more like, am I watching a screen unnecessarily? And is this shiny object syndrome getting to me? The web surfing, the YouTube surfing, watching comedians <laughs> on YouTube, uh, getting sucked into some sort of political YouTube or some sort of news website or something that has nothing to do with trading. And in trading in and of itself, I begin to think, is this really the best trade that I could find? And should I just opt for doing nothing? Now, without going into a lot of details, there's always going to be an expense in your life. And there's always going to be an unexpected expense in your life. And I've had a lot of those, as I've been preaching about with this move to the new office slash house. And that's put a lot of pressure on me to try to take money out of the market. And the market doesn't care when you need money. The market decides to give you money when it wants to. It sort of has, has a life of its own. And that sounds a little strange, but if you've been trading for a while, you'll know there's periods of time when out of the blue, you'll start printing money. And rarely is that does that coincide with when you really need the money. So there's always an external pressure on you you have to deal with. And along the lines of small actions and attractions, I checked my junk email filter, and that's the first, the first time I checked this in, in many years, because I just figured filters 
labeled junk, it's probably some stuff from Nigeria in there or these scumbags trying to sell their get rich quick system of the month. But lo and behold, inside of there was the business deal waiting for me to sign. Now, another thing that came out of this is that I found that these attractions began to create coincidences. When I moved, all my books got packed away and the nightstand just got taped up and moved. And when I opened my nightstand looking for something to read, I found Napoleon Hill's Think and Go Rich. It was also a Russian copy of Dave Landry on swing trading, which I unpacked quickly many years ago and I just threw it in there. I think we had people coming over or something. I just had to throw some stuff, you know, <laughs> throw my dirty clothes under the bed, threw the book back at the nightstand, and it's been there ever since. Since I don't read Russian, and as I said in the column, I know how the story ends, I opted to start reading Think and Go Rich again. Now, the first time I read it many years ago, I, I didn't take a whole lot of action, maybe a few things, but no specific action that I re that I remember. But one of the things that Hill talked about is what are you going to do in return? So I took my affirmations and then I added in return to them both business affirmations and more importantly, my trading affirmations. And I found that that spawned off a bunch of little things that helped. Now, along the lines of little things or taking action, my wife had some business associates over recently and she came in here, showed in the office and we did these floating bookshelves ourselves. The, uh, the carpenter is backed up for about six months, but he was able to get us the wood which is some really cool cypress, two inches thick and just pretty awesome. Anyway, we were, she was showing off the office to him and I'm in here working and one of the girls said, the question is, have you read all these books? And there's piles of books on the floor and boxes full of them. I'm looking around my office as I talk. And I was kind of sheepish in my answer because there were, there were quite a few I have when I unpacked that I didn't read, and I have them in a stack on the shelf, but I have read most of the books, but the thing that struck a chord with me is how much have I acted on what I've read. The Napoleon Hill in return got me thinking about this. So the in return led to my, again, my mission statement for trading and for business. Now, I'm not going to give you my business mission statement, and I'm kind of half kidding, but just in case my competition is is watching today <laughs> or whatever, I, you know, as I said in the column, I really don't think I have any any competition, and that's not to be vain. It's actually a bit of a bummer in some ways because, one, you don't make a whole lot of money selling reality. I can tell you that right now, and that's what I'm selling. The scumbags out there are selling this BS. It's like make 10 million in 10 minutes a day, and that's one of the ads that I've seen. Someday I'm going to make a file on all these, but it's just it's just too much. And then as somebody pointed out, there's another guy out there. Every month comes out with the latest and greatest trading system. It sounds to me like he's grill hunting and just selling you his latest grail. Anyway, one thing I do want to share is that all this thinking got me to thinking, in addition to having all these books on display and many more, which will probably have to end up in the attic because this office is much smaller than my prior one, I will read daily to improve myself on a personal business and trading level. Well, I'm doing that anyway, but what's the in return? Well, I will put these things into action and not just read them once. Now, I read Scott Adams' book, and I thought these affirmations were great. And that, that's kind of how the whole ball got to rolling with all this. And when I saw Napoleon Hill, I got to thinking, it's like, well, Scott Adams said, have these affirmations. 
but he really didn't say that you should do something. It's kind of like a, just a dream. Well, I went back and looked at what I earmarked and underlined, and I saw that he actually did say a lot about doing things. And that's got me thinking even more that I need to dust off, that I should dust off all these books and make sure that I'm acting upon some of these things. And he was talking about the best advice that was given to him, and he didn't say who gave it to him. But he said, if you want success, figure out the price and pay it. So here's the trading part of my mission statement. I, Dave Landry, will have a liquid net worth of a slightly absurd amount. And again, I have an exact figure in mind. In return, I will trade the best and leave the rest ogre and trend trades, even if it means occasionally watching a mediocre setup take off without me. I will plan the trade, trade a plan. I will review the plan, the Landry list, and the trading service spreadsheet before, during, and after the open. I will utilize alerts and hard orders, such as a hard stop, and in some cases a limit order, and I'll walk you through that in a minute, to get me in or take me out of stocks before each and every trade, especially those that were not part of the original plan. I will read my three by five bookmark card, and that's the little bookmark that I use in my trader's journal. I'm a big fan of Robert Morrow's book, and that's one of the first books that I plan on dusting off and really putting to work. And his book is called The Kaizen Way. And it's basically about making a bunch of little small changes. Well, years ago, I read that if you want to get better, just make a bunch of little small changes. And they equated it to a race car designer. A race car designer doesn't lop off a wheel or half the engine or whatever to try to reduce weight in a car. They take one little tiny thing and they figure out how they can make it a little lighter. Now, this is this is not a street legal Ferrari. This is a racing Ferrari. It's called La Ferrari, which means the Ferrari. And I never heard of this car, but I took a chance and watched Top Gear, the final tour, or whatever they call it, the Grand Tour on Netflix. And I was a little disappointed in it, but that's another conversation altogether. But one thing I did get out of it that was pretty cool was when they showed the bonnet stick, for lack of a better word, or the hood stick, the thing that holds up the hood, it was carbon fiber. And in making it out of carbon fiber, they've saved, Ferrari saved 100 grams on this car. Now, how much is 100 grams? It's about a lemon, about the weight of a lemon. Well, that's really no big deal. But if you do that a few thousand times and a bunch of small changes before you know it, you have the Ferrari. So it's been said before, if you want to make a big change in your life, make a little change. Now, we have a homeostasis about us that keeps us alive. And one of the things that I wanted to touch upon a little bit today, but ran out of time, is neurology. And I've talked about it before, and I plan on coming back to it in coming weeks. And the beauty about neurology is we all share the same neurology. Some people will argue that we don't share the same psychology when it comes to trading, but for the most part, I think we do. Some people have some issues and some people have others. But for the most part, we're all subject to the same sort of fear and greed and want and needs when it comes to the markets. But the neurology is pretty much the same. We all have a brain in our head. Heads, some of us at least. <laughs> it can be argued that some of us don't, but that's another story. But anyway, your body, specifically the primal part of your brain, the autonomous part, the subconscious part, the limbic system, all of that small stuff deep down, the so-called lizard brain. I have a, I think next year, at some point, I'm gonna go live with video in these presentations. And I'll be doing that also in the Trading Simplified show over at Stock Charts. And 
it'll make it kind of fun to share things like I've got a brain on the other desk, which I'll I'll plan on eventually deconstructing it. It's a model brain. And I was playing with it the other day and I noticed that lo and behold, it does look like a lizard brain, the something you'd see in an alligator or something. When you look at that lower part of your brain and as I said before, it's fast acting. It doesn't really think much. It just kind of reacts. And sometimes you need those reactions. You go to step off a curb and a cab's coming at you. You better jump back on that curb or you're going to get run over. You don't have much time, as I preach, to contemplate your navel. Now, the homeostasis of that subconscious brain is very, very, very resistant to change. And as an example, I talked about in the column, the biggest losers often become the biggest gainers. I've seen a few articles out there on some of these people. Now, there's actually some physical reasons, but I guarantee you a big part of that is based upon the neurology. The body is fighting back. The body is thinking that it's being starved, so it's fighting back the best it can to keep that homeostasis anyway a lot of those biggest losers have turned around to become the biggest gainers ended up much fatter than they were before the show now an example closer to home and this is not actually them <laughs> but i thought it would be funny to put a little picture of them up to grab a clip art picture but anyway and they're a freaking blast. We have a really good time when they come over. He's a great cook. She's a pretty good cook, cook too, especially on some specific dishes, which she makes, some signature dishes. And they're just a heck of a lot of fun to hang out with, except when they're dieting. They go on a fad diet about three times a year. And then they come over and they're just boring. And they're not fun to be around. They're hungry, they're sugarloaf, they're crotchety and many other things which are not fun. And then two or three weeks later, we'll see in the Facebook feed, my wife will point out to me usually, hey, look at these guys. They're partying like rock stars. They'll find some long lost friends and you'll see they're eating and drinking and having a good time. Well, that's because their bodies have resisted these drastic changes that they've put them through. John Wooden, when you prove a little each day, eventually big things occur. This quote comes from the Kaizen way. Now, one thing that the Kaizen way talked about is to tiptoe past your fears. And I kind of see that little part of your brain, the amygdala, specifically as a panic monster. And that's what often controls you, even if you don't know it, it's controlling you to get in or out of the market that you shouldn't be getting in or out of, to panic, to freak out, and so on and so forth. And that's why I often say, the easiest thing to do is count to three. And, and I have a little commitment device I'm gonna share with you in a few minutes, which really has helped me with the panic monster. Now, the panic monster concept, I borrowed from wait, but why? And, and that's one of those things, when you're going down that YouTube rabbit hole, that's a pretty good one to watch. He does a TED talk and it's hilarious. And he talks a lot about procrastination and all. So I borrowed his concept of the panic monster and I equated that to the lower level of the brain. And you don't want to wake that panic monster. And like Mara says, you could tiptoe past your fears and you do that by making a lot of little small gradual changes. And that part of your brain doesn't even realize that these changes are being made, as opposed to my friends who have these drastic diet changes on these fad diets. If you're making small gradual changes, that little part of your brain 
never notices. And I guess the example would be for exercise, you park a little further out every time you go to the store. Well, your body's not gonna freak out by walking a few extra steps. So kind of mashing weight but why and the Kais and where together, you wanna tiptoe past the panic monster. You don't wanna set off any alarms in your head. And you do that through a lot of small gradual changes. Now, as I said earlier, I did my big picture affirmation and the money didn't fall from the sky, but hey, it's not 2024 yet, so we'll see. But as I also said, well, what if I just did some smaller ones that would still be really impressive if they came true, like the business deal, but wouldn't be huge, something that's a lot more attainable. And then taking one step further with your big affirmation and your not so big affirmations, what micro affirmations could you make? And the more I thought about this, it's like the here and the now, the, my now column is kind of a takeoff on that. It's like, what's happening now? What can you do now to move you towards those goals? What's goals and dreams and aspirations? What small step can you take? And in addition to taking those small steps, you can affirm that you're going to take those small steps. And I do believe that's the conduit that's going to get you there. So out of all this came my trading mission. And in that trading mission, I put my in return. My in return says, I will trade the best and leave the rest ogre Ed Trend trades, even if that occasionally means watching a mediocre setup, setup take off without me. That's one of my big issues, is that because I'm looking at 2,000 stocks every day, I'm going to see a stock that took off. And I'm going to, of course, wish that I was in that stock. And in some cases, it'll be a stock that's on my short list or my radar, my call list. And if it takes off without me, I get really, really upset. So when I wrote this mission statement, I knew that I would have to put something in here about that. So even if it means occasionally watching a mediocre setup take off without me. Now, that part is pick the best, leave the rest. I realize that's a little vague and not very specific and small and tiny action. But as I often say, you need to take the F yeah test when you're looking at stocks. And then the other thing is to time travel. So if you're looking at a stock and you're thinking, oh man, this thing looks fantastic. You can't wait to place that order the next day, or if it's an IPO, on the close of that day, then by all means, take the trade. So when you time travel, even though it sounds like a, a strange thing, you need to say, okay, let's say that I took this trade and I got stopped out. In your mind, could you feel like you could say, so what and next? Now this time travel actually has a name, it's called mind sculpting. And I think Ian Robinson cornered that phrase. And I think I've got the Ian Robinson's book, Mind Sculpting, from the Kaizen Way. So that sounds like another book that I probably should reread that's collecting dust. But in your mind sculpting, it's like, okay, if this thing stopped me out, could I and would I shout next? That looked great. If I saw the same setup again today, I would take it. Or if you feel like, man, I'm really gonna be bummed out if I lose money on that trade. Well, if you're feeling like you really be bummed out, then that's probably not a trade you should be taking. Now, you need to look at it and see what's the potential upside. And that's the big problem that a lot of people 
don't do is how much money could you really make on a trade? And countless times people have asked me about stocks that have a big mound of overhead, res overhead resistance just above where their entry would be and their gains would likely be limited. But if you think something could get into clear air and stay there and really take off, and that makes you pretty excited, then again, you should take the trade. But if you're kind of like, eh, it's gonna probably have a hard time moving from here, or how far could it really move over a fairly short period of time? And then the other thing you wanna do is you wanna really honestly ask yourself, is the risk versus reward worth it monetarily versus mentally? I'll see some really good speculative setups, and I'm like, boy, that's gonna be risky. But I really think this stock could double or triple over a short period of time. So I think it's worth the trade. But always remember, there is a mental issue with a loss. And it's not the loss in and of itself with that one trade. As I've said before, if you've ever snapped at a family member or a friend or whoever, when they do something that's a little bit aggravating and you appear to to an outsider you look like a lunatic you appear to be like overly crazy and like if you have kids they do something and you just snap and you possibly give them a a, a huge punishment it's like the crime doesn't fit the punishment and i have examples that i've given to this over and over in my columns it's not that one act in and of itself it's all the acts similar to that in the past. So a lot of times a loss is not a loss in and of itself in a trade. It's the mental anguish that you have from every other loss that you've ever had. So you're going to have to really think long and hard. Is the risk worth it monetarily? And that's fairly easy to define. It's like provided, you know, opening gaps, of course, with a side. But you're like, okay, well, I can risk 2% two, two of my count on this. But are you willing to truly accept that risk? So are you willing to take that risk from a mental standpoint? And that's a lot harder, believe it or not, than the monetary standpoint. Now, along the lines of pick the best, lead the rest, there's some art to stock selection. And I think that anyone can learn the art part over time. And I think the way you get to the art part is you study the mechanical part. Now it took me 14 hours to cover what I think has to be covered in stock selection. But the bottom line is most of it is a lot of little simple things. And the more you learn to recognize the simple things, the better off you are. You are. For instance, in this little figure here, the chart on the left is accelerating higher. The chart on the right is decelerating. Both are in uptrends. Both have if they're to scale, have covered the same amount of ground, but one is losing steam and one is gaining momentum. And as I often say, if you come to enough of these Week in Charts shows and look at some of the stocks that are being asked about, many of those, there are many little simple things that should be glaring to you, such as deceleration versus acceleration. And as you get more and more experience, you, you'll know exactly what you should be trading and what you should be leaving alone. I will plan the trade and trade the plan, continuing along the mission statement. Now, that's one of those cliche things, but I can't beat the dead horse enough on that. And in addition to planning the trade, trade the plan, we all could do that, okay? at least the planning part. We all could plan the trade. That's pretty easy. You look at a stock, you're like, okay, let's give it a little wiggle room on the entry. Oh, this thing's bouncing around three or four points a day. I better, I better put my stop down here a little bit further outside of that normal noise. And let's do some math, entry minus the stop. Oh, that gives me the initial profit target. I got this thing all planned out. All right, I'm ready. Well, Trading that plan is hard, okay? Make no bones about it. And there's a lot of psychological reasons for that. And as I learned from 
Brett Steenbarger, there's actually two U's, and I've done complete presentations just on this. So when you're planning the trade, your left brain, which is your more logical part of your brain, is helping you to do the math and plan that trade. But when you actually place the trade, your emotional parts of your brain, specifically the more primal parts, your subconscious area, the amygdala, limbic system, all those things we talked about earlier, and your right brain, which is the more emotional part of your brain, the creative side begins to take over. So in reviewing your plan, when you go to make the trade, you're one step, one small step closer to actually following that plan. Now, I've had cases where I've recommended stocks and not bother to take them myself. So that's why I put in here, I'm going to look at my service spreadsheet, which has the plan. I'm going to look at my trading plan. I'm going to do things like set up my monitors before the open. So I have a pretty good idea of what I'm doing. If it's a position trade, I have an exact idea of what I'm doing. I'm also going to do things like set up my watch list on my screens. And one of my newer things that I do, that I've written down actually, and I do is I'm gonna take care of all my existing positions first, meaning I'm gonna take profits. I am going to, if offered obviously, I'm gonna honor my stops or make sure those stop orders become hard stop orders when possible and do all these things that I need to do in my own portfolio first, because sometimes I've come in and I wasn't really paying attention because I'm too busy looking for some new exciting opening gap reversal or something like that, that I neglect to notice that one of my positions or more have hit the initial profit target. And by the time I get around to looking at my existing positions, I realize that I've already given up too much of that initial profits and it's too late to take those profits. Now, the thing that I talked about in the column was that it all, as Murphy would have it, the fires, the business fires, my website crashes, or there's some YouTube video that pops up when I'm putting my mark in the minute on there that kind of attracts me to it, it's shiny object, so to speak or some other distraction, my wife's first business appointment usually is no earlier than nine o'clock. And since we've moved to this new place, she leaves exactly 30 minutes before. Well, what happens at 8, 29, 59? Well, <laughs> the market opens. So literally right as the market is opening, my wife often opens the door to my office to tell me about a plumbing problem, that a contractor just showed up, or there's an accounting problem or an issue, or I need to move some money or whatever. And sometimes she just wants to say, hey, babe, I'm headed off to work. And then she's looking extra hot and that's a distraction. And that always seems to happen right around that opening bell my trade station dings reminded me that the market has opened and actually that's that that's another little tiny little thing to protect me from me because in the past i've missed opens because my website has crashed or whatever has happened or something interrupted me but usually the shtf happens right around then so I need a lot of little commitment devices to predict to protect me from me. And some of these safeguards are alerts, which I can place before the market opens. And these can alert me to the fact that I might need to take some action. And once the market opens, I can place some hard orders. Now, there's been many cases where I'll come in at the end of the day or during the middle of the day, I should say, and I put a stop entry order in on a position and then forgot about it. And I'll look at my portfolio and 
down a point in this one, down two points in this one, up 10 cents in one, uh, whoopee, you know. And then I look at my equity and somehow I'm up a little bit or in some cases a lot. And I'm like, well, wait a minute, I'm losing money on all these trades. How the hell am I making money? Well, what will happen is that stop entry order will trigger on a potential position, not all the time, but sometimes. And I'll already have a pretty good start towards that initial profit target on a trade that I could easily have forgotten about with all the shiny objects all around. So I would recommend using stop entry orders when possible for all orders. I am amazed at how many times that that has kept me out of trouble, especially in something like an opening gap reversal trade. And I'll give you, for instance, or just I'll give you an example here. Let's say you're trading a pullback. And I have a real example in an opening gap reversal in a minute. But let's say you're trading a pullback. And the market pulls back and you like the pullback. You got a nice uptrend. You got your nice little pullback. You're like, you know what? I'm going to enter right here. And if I get triggered, I'll put a stop in here. And I'll put an initial profit target somewhere up here. Well, if you put in a hard stop and let's say the stock rallies up, comes back in, then you get no trigger. But if you're off at lunch or whatever, chasing shiny objects, whatever the case may be, and that stop is in, the pl in place, if that market begins to take off, it's going to trigger you in. And not all the time, but many times you'll come back and you'll be pleasantly surprised. Now, on the flip side, there's been a lot of cases, many, 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 where, especially like an open gap reversal, so you've got a stock up here, it gaps down here, now this is an intraday chart, and it begins to rally a little bit, and I'm thinking, hey, you know what, I'm just going to jump in right here at the market, whatever, because this thing is beginning to rally, and I'll just say, well, settle down, Beavis. What if we put a stop entry order in here and you relax? I know, haha. -ha. And I'm shocked, not all the time, but many times the market will rally up. And, and I had quite a few cases where it's come within one cent, one cent of that entry and then implode. And I've avoided so many losing trades just by using a stop order. And I need to make sure that I add in. Let's see, I'm, this is for selfish reasons. I do these presentations because I learn myself sometimes. But I probably need to add that in to my plan if I haven't already done so. Now, the other thing too is, let's say you have a thin, a spiky market or something like an IPO or a little shipping stock or something which has the potential to make a big move really fast. And if you don't have an order in place, I'm not a huge fan of limit orders because I like to try to squeeze a little bit extra out of positions. I'd rather use an alert to alert me to the fact that I need to take some action. But if it's a spiky market, uh, especially if you've only been in a few days, kind of like T and K, which we'll talk about in a few minutes, then put in an actual limit order to take those partial profits for you. The other thing, kind of backing into it a little bit, but the other thing that happens when you place hard orders, in other words, actual orders with your broker, is that you give up that decision-making process, that active decision-making process. And active decision-making is very difficult, but passive decision-making is easy, it happens automatically. And by having that stop entry order in place or a limit order or a hard stop to take you out of the stock, a lot of times the market takes you out and you're a little bit more like, so what? But if you're sitting there watching that stock go against you and pass your stop order, where your order should be, I should say, then that's going to be pretty tough. And that's going to put yourself in a state of regret and you could lose a lot of money in the process. Yeah, I have it in here. I forgot that it was in here. I will utilize hard alerts and hard orders. I will utilize alerts and hard orders to get me in and take me out of stocks. 
And again, that simple little stupid thing has been a godsend. Now, before each and every trade, especially those that were not part of the original plan. But Dave, I thought you said to plan your trade, trade your plan. Well, yeah, if you're looking at a pullback in a stock after the market's closed, and you say, yeah, I'm going to get in here, put a stop here, trail stop here, blah, blah, blah. This is how I'm going to play it. That's your plan. But if you're looking at something like an opening gap reversal, you're not going to know sometimes until after the market opens, if you're trading like an ETF on where it's going to open and whether or not it's going to be a trade. So some of that you're going to have to do on the fly. But even in doing that on the fly, give yourself or make sure you have a plan in place. And again, use a hard order. So here's a little card I keep in my trading journal. And I force myself to read this before each and every trade. I, Dave Lander, will take the best ogre and trend trades, even if this means passing on an okay opportunity and watching it take off without me. The other day, I was watching bonds late in the day. It was early in the day. It was kind of an opening gap reversal type of situation. It didn't pan out. And I told myself, you know what? Okay, Dave, it's late in the day, 30 minutes left of trading. You were supposed to play the open again reversal here, and you did, but it didn't trigger. It didn't happen. That stop order was in place, but it did get triggered. You made the decision to take that order off because it's no longer an opening gap reversal. And then, like an idiot, you're watching the screen late in the day, and you're watching those bonds begin to reverse. You're kind of like, aha, I knew they would reverse. Well, that was outside of your original intention. And then I began to read this card over and over. And that got me thinking, okay, well, wait a minute. This is kind of like an okay opportunity. What if it takes off without me? And then I kept reading this card and I finally I just said, so what? So what? It's not, it's not worth it. Now, as I put this together, there were so many other things I want to talk about, and a few of those things I touched upon today, but there's a lot more to all this, and I think that my trading mission is going to become a little bit larger. I do have a project I'm working on. I'm not ready to go public with it yet, although I feel like when I go public with things, it forces me to get them done. But this is going to be a much, much bigger part of this trading mission. And I think that so far, a lot of the things that I've written about are going to find its way into all this. So I think this is just, I think we're just scratching the surface here. But I would encourage you to take my trading mission and make it your own and figure out what those little commitment devices are. And that's going to be probably a lot of presentations in and out of themselves. And something as stupid as reading that little three by five card before making a potential trade, especially if it's something that's unplanned, like a day trade or an ogre trade or something, that in and of itself, at least for me, has saved me quite a bit. It helps to slow down that fast acting emotional part of my brain and get to the rest of what's sloshing around up there. Now, I think that in upcoming webinars, I'm going to probably talk a lot more about these little kais and small actions. And to build a race car, I think you you take a lot of little small actions to improve upon the race car. And I think that that's the same thing when it comes to your trading psychology, your trading is do a lot of little small things. Don't shock the system to tiptoe past that panic monster. Another thing that I was thinking about, which I think might find its way into some of these presentations, is when trading is at its easiest and when it's at its hardest. And some of the writing that I've been doing lately, I've noticed that I, I tend to print money before I have a big speaking engagement. Now, why is that? I, I don't know. I don't know if that's pure luck that I catch the cycle just right or if in the six weeks before I go to speak, I find myself wanting to show as many live examples as possible. If you see me speak online or in person, you know that I nearly always put in a live example. 
So it's not like these scumbags out there are going to email you when they finally hit one trade and make it look like they do that every day. Anyway, so part of the printing money could be that maybe I'm working hard to have some really good live examples going in. I don't know, but it does seem like whenever I have a big trip in the works, my trading gets a lot better. And I can think back to several trips in my head. It seems like in several big winners that came along with that. And I had quite a few to show last few times I spoke. But trading then becomes its hardest when I get back. I get a little too full of myself and I recognize that because people's like, hey, Dave, you sure made it look easy. You showed us these setups. You walked us through them. They made so much sense. You know what? I think I can do that at home. And I get back home and I'm like, well, I'm Dave Landry, <laughs> you know, and that's usually when I get my ass handed to me. So that's one of the things that I think the mission statement could really help. Again, a little neurology. You don't have to know a lot of neurology, although I'm, I am studying more and more of to try to figure out what's going on up there. But I think a little bit of neurology really helps. And again, we all have a shared neurology. So if you could wrap your head around that, that's going to help you with a lot of your psychological issues, which we don't always share the same ones. But if you understand the neurology, then you might understand why you're doing things from a psychological standpoint. That's one thing I don't understand about psychology is you don't hear them talk enough about the neurology behind it. But I digress. And then I think there's a lot of little tweaks. I think that's going to be a constant improvement type of thing. Just a lot of little things that we can do to tweak things. And I'm going to share some successes along the way. And I think it's going to be tough, but I'll also have some confessions for you. And some of this, again, is coming from Dalio's book, where he talks about radical transparency. And I want to do more and more of that over time and that's going to take a little time to roll its way out another thing i also want to talk about over time is going to be attraction coincidences and i'm kind of blown away by how if you put some plans into motion and you affirm them and you come up with little things you're going to do to make them happen that coincidence will begin to happen and a little bit of luck will happen all right let's shift gears here and talk about the methodology in action. This is something that I want to do more and more and more of. Recently, we had this T and K trade, and it was in the trading service back in the middle of November. I guess we're still in the middle of November. And we had a buy at 210, a stop at 160, initial profit of 260 for a half a point risk. So the entry is here, the stop is here. Dave, that seems like a wide stop. Well, that's what it calls for. The volatility is pretty high and our initial profit target was way up there at 260. So let's take a look at what happened. Again, T and K was a buy, entry of 210, stop at 160. That's a half a point risk, $100,000, hypothetical account okay and i did take this trade and i do take nearly all trades that i mentioned in the service and if not that particular trade something similar to it which might be a little bit more volatile a little bit more a little bit more scarier type of trade which i'd be a little nervous to broadcast out for the most part what you see here is what you get or what i get and with a half a point risk you would buy 4,000 shares because you're risking $2,000. You lose a half a point. You want to lose no more than $2,000. And that gives you an initial profit target of 260. Now, somebody's asked me before, and it's a good problem to have. It's like, hey, Dave, you know, based on my account size, I'm buying like 20,000 shares. What do you think about that? You think I could maybe buy a little bit less? You sh should I still go over 2%? Well, that's a good problem to have. And, and yeah, on a, especially in a lower price issue like this, even if you just bought 10,000 shares and the thing really, really took off, you probably would still do pretty well. And it would decrease the volatility of your portfolio. Of course, you'd make less, 
but yeah, that's one of the good problems they have is that if you do have a sizable account and you're trading a small issue, then you could end up really moving a big size around. But money wise, to me, it's kind of all the same. Anyway, initial profit target of 260. So this is what happened with this one. And it got there or almost there, I should say, pretty quickly. So let's see, one, two, three, like four or five days into the trade, it got there. Well, almost there. It came within one cent of the initial profit target. As I preach, don't split hairs, especially if you get into something and three or four days later, in this case, I guess it was two days later, it's at or near the initial profit target. Make sure you lock in those profits, even if it's a penny away. And that's one thing that I'm trying to figure out a way to improve upon is that it's hard to make something mechanical work. You have to use a little bit of your brain. So my initial profit target was at 260. It got to 259. Let's hope it gets there officially, but it might not. So using a little bit of your brain, it's like, eh, 259, that's close enough, especially when it's bidding up pre-market. You know it's going to gap open. It could come back in. I've done these presentations before and it's like, well, Dave, you set the IPT at 260. Why didn't you set it at 159? It's like, well, if I can get it to the penny, you'd never see my fat ass again. So once you do take that initial profit target, then obviously you wanna get that stop up to break even as soon as possible. Now, this is what it looked like a little while ago. Once again, we got fairly close to the initial profit target, so don't split hairs again on something like this. Now here's another one that we are short. And I think, I don't know if I have it here, but I'll be happy to show you a snapshot of the entire portfolio. In fact, I'll give you a link in one second where you can see the portfolio. It'll have a little delay to it, but it's good enough to where you can still see what's going on. So this PAGS, remember back in September, the market was kind of looking a little toppy and we had a plethora of shorts setting up and PAGS was one of them. And it had a nice little sell off. And then we looked to play the first thrust setup and it triggers an entry and of course it goes up right away making you really doubt the setup then it begins to sell off looking pretty good then it goes back up down up down and then up again and i know a lot of people probably gave up somewhere in here because it wasn't acting well but it still looked like a major top and more importantly, the most important thing to remember is that the stop was not hit, which was up here somewhere. So as long as the stop is not hit, you have to stick with it. I know, easier said than done. And that's why I have all those dead money reports is because a lot of people give up way too early on positions. And if you quit too early, you're never going to catch or capture the occasional home run. So we did have a gap lower and then it began to pull back again and you're probably questioning, well, should we just get out of it because it's probably all it's going to go. And then we had a gap lower yesterday again and then we had a nice little follow through to the downside. So, so far we've been able to trail that stop a little lower on this one like this and stick with the position. And what I'll probably do over the next few weeks is I'll probably walk you through the entire portfolio one by one. And, you know, maybe I need to talk a little bit more about my thinking behind some of these going in. Okay. I do like to trade opening gap reversals. It's a little bit outside of the methodology, especially when it's against the trend. But my favorite ones are definitely with the trend and ideally within a setup. So I'm wondering if instead of just seeing these as S and G trades, meaning for fun, make a little money here and there, could they be a little bit more? Now, in an ideal world, this might be a pipe dream. I was trying to explain this to my wife and she didn't, she didn't get it. But in an ideal world, it's like you're taking these position trades, which are going to have drawdowns, which are going to have losses. If in the meantime, you could find some of these opening gap reversals to sort of make a little money, I, I wanna stop short of using the word income, but make a little money 
here and there to maybe smooth out that equity curve. And in a, in a, pipe, a pipe dream situation, I like to make enough on the opening gap reversals to keep the equity curve flat until the real money comes in when those trades continue higher after hitting that initial profit target. Now, I haven't figured that out yet, but believe me, I'm working on it. So here's the textbook example that I refer to when it comes to the opening gap reversals. Notice that Cree back in the summer was not only trending higher, but it was beginning to trend higher. It begins to pull back and then it has this really nice gap lower. And then it reverses and has a really nice trend day higher. This is the ultimate goal with these is to be able to get in somewhere around the open and ride it out for the rest of the day and exit somewhere around the close and maybe take a little profits somewhere in between. Now, yesterday, we did have a stock that was trending nicely. It wasn't a perfect pullback, but the gap was a little bit extreme to the downside to a point where I had to think long and hard on whether or not I was going to trade it. I almost took it off of my screen because I knew if I didn't, I'd be tempted to trade it before I actually made that decision. Now let's take a look at what actually happened here. So we had the big gap lower. And while I was in the thinking phase, I posted it up on Facebook in my Facebook group. If you are a gold member of DayLander.com, make sure you join the Facebook group. We have a lot of fun there. We also flesh out a lot of potential positions. And as I've been saying quite a bit, my goal is to have a one-to-many business model where I help a lot of people as opposed to the one-on-one. -on -one. And in addition to that, I'd like to get a mastermind group started. By accident, the Facebook group has become the mastermind group, so far at least, because there's a lot of good traders in there. And a lot of these guys and girls are answering questions for me and finding some nice looking setups, especially with the IPOs. Anyway, while I was in the thinking phase, I put a post up and because it wasn't a cut and dry setup, I didn't go into any details because I myself wasn't sure whether or not I was going to take the trade. I also had to finish my slides for my stock chart show and I was scrambling to get all these things done. So I decided, well, I think it might be worth a shot. And what do I want out of the trade? Well, I think three points would probably be a good initial profit target in this particular case. And then a stop below the low, which is two points in change. So let's say three points below would probably be a good place to put the stop. Because if it triggers and then makes new lows, you know you're wrong. But you want to give a little bit of wiggle room. Now, in addition to that stop being there, I put it in as a trailing stop. So if this market rallied and stopped me into the position and then kept rallying and made it to my initial profit target, then I don't have to do anything on the position. I just let that trailing stop take me out of the rest. So the initial profit target was a limit up there at 35, 40, and my stop entry, 32.40, and the trailing stop was three points. So in an ideal world, rallies up three points. I take my profit out. It continues to rally the rest of the day like the Cree trade. And then I change my trailing stop to a market on close order or just exit on the market manually. So this is what my screen looked like when I was setting it up. Obviously, the only thing that would be on the screen would be the stop entry before it triggers. So this is what happened. The stock triggers, begins rallying up, and it gets pretty close to that initial profit target, but it just can't seem to get there. And as part of my radical transparency, not that you want to look in my head, <laughs> do the voices in my head bother you? But this, here's my here's my middle masturbation. I've been in this trade less than 30 minutes. 
I'm up 2.6 points in less than 30 minutes. That's about 1% on my entire portfolio based on two of my active accounts or more active accounts, I should say. It wasn't a perfect setup to begin with because as I showed you a minute ago, it wasn't like in that Cree trade where it pulls back quite a bit or gaps quite a bit lower, but not like a super extreme gap lower. And because it wasn't a perfect setup, is this a bit of a, a gift horse, especially given the fact that I am under deadline. And if I spend too much time watching the stupid screen, I'm not gonna get my slides done. That's probably why I'm late for so many of these shows because I'm sitting here looking at a stupid screen instead of working on my slides. But I'm not gonna get my slides done. And you know, that's a lot of money. Thousands of dollars in less than 30 minutes. Let me annualize that. If I made that every morning, that would be millions of dollars a year. Now that's a silly game I'm thinking in my head. But then again, millions of dollars. Wow, that's fantastic. And then I begin to think, was my initial profit target too aggressive to begin with? And I think it was, because when you look at the actual daily chart, you'll see that three and a half points was a bit of an extreme move for this one to make. And the other thing, which has nothing to do with trading, and this is something that we're kind of backing into now, but as Tom McClellan once said, people buy and sell stocks for a lot of reasons. And a lot of times those reasons have nothing to do with trading. As his late mother Marion said, people buy and sell stocks for a variety of reasons. Some people buy when they have money, some people sell when they need money, and others use for more sophisticated methods. So I was thinking about selling this stock. Why? Well, because I want to be in a good mood going into my show. Well, that has nothing to do with trading, okay? But that's just the thought process that was going through my head. And the other thing is Facebook is watching. And you'll notice in that Facebook post that I put up a little while ago, Chris asked me, all right, Dave, what did you do? <laughs> it's like, oh, crap, you know? And that, again, it's got me thinking about this radical transparency. So all of these thoughts, some of which have nothing to do with trading, which you can see a lot going through my head with this particular trade. And I think what I finally decided upon, in addition to specifically the 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 dead heart the dead horse the gift horse I, I say dead horse so many times i want to say dead horse in addition to the gift horse the setup really wasn't that great to begin with so i think that this was a bit again of a gift so by the time i sold out it began to implode a little bit and i was able to get out of half at these levels and those, if you back up the slides one, you can see where that was. And then I bumped the stop up to break even because the trailing stop wasn't quite there yet. And I scratched out of the rest. Now I ended up with 0.4% in 30 minutes. And that's much better than a poke in the eye. So that's how that one played out. This was not a perfect setup by any means, but that's one of the things that I wanna do with you guys to show you some of the less than perfect setups that are still possibly worthy and what happens. Now, what I would encourage you to do to learn about the core methodology, which is our bread and butter, is to review the archives. And if you're on the trading service, they're right below the trading service page. And if you're not, you could just go to DaveLanner.com and don't worry about that big old URL because it's going to take you there anyway. So just go to DaveLanner.com slash archives and do some walkthroughs. Walk through some of these services when the market is choppy. Walk through the service when the market is trending. Walk through some that roll over when it rolls over and just see how it all shakes out to see what I see ahead of time. All right. My wife says, are you asking people for business? <laughs> so. Uh, yeah, so I would encourage you to join Dave Landry members, become a gold member. We have a really good group. And again, that's part of the mastermind lofty goal that I have. And, and I think that you guys have really been very impressive in making that goal come true a lot sooner than I thought. I thought we'd be a couple of years down the road before we are where we are. So 
thank you guys for joining. If you're not a member, 47 bucks a month, there is a plethora of stuff. I promise that'll make it worth your while. This is what the back end looks like in the members area. We got four members courses and then the premium courses are unlocked for free over time. All right, let's hop into the live charts. If you guys want to start asking about individual stocks, feel free to do so now. All right, let's take a look at the P's. S&P 500, kind of a little ho-hum today. Sold off a little bit, but kind of hanging in there. And not to confuse the issue with facts, but the market is climbing the wall of worry. In a bull market, bad news is good, and good news is good. In a bear market, bad news is bad, and good news is bad. So right now, I'm not seeing a whole lot of good news out there. It doesn't seem like it, at least. Maybe the media is just fear-mongering a little bit. But so far, so good. Nice little breakout remains attack of the piece. Kind of climbing the wall of worry. I'm impressed at how resilient this market has been. The other thing that's that has me impressed is way back here, somewhere, I forget exactly where, but it's in the spreadsheet, the TFM 10% system actually triggered an entry. And it's been a little bumpy ride higher, but now we're like 10% higher from where we were. Just by chance, it's 10% higher. It has nothing to do with the system itself. But I thought that was kind of cool, some sort of little objective measurement to get you into the market, get you in the market or make you a little concerned when the market's in trouble, has been long for a long, long time and has ridden out some pretty serious corrections. Let's take a look at NASDAQ. NASDAQ, same sort of action as the P's, a little bit of a sell-off yesterday, a little tiny bit of a sell-off today, but so far kind of hanging in there. In fact, these indices could use a correction. Let's go back to the P's for a second. One of my big concerns, and this isn't a radical one, but if sometimes if the market, let's say, is way down here and then comes all the way back to up here, you got a big old V-shaped recovery at high levels. Those are kind of hard to sustain. You can see this last one we had here. We had a pretty serious sell-off afterwards, right? So we did have a bit of a sell-off in the market and it did rally higher. And if you look at it, and let's just do it on a closing basis as we could do here in TC. Let's see, to right there. So that was a that was an 8% run. And that's a pretty big run for a short period of time for an index, okay? So this market is very overbought and due to correct. So it's not really surprising me that the market's correcting a little bit. In fact, it's a good thing that it is correcting. I know if you're long, you're like, oh, Dave, but I'm long, I'm losing some money. Well, that's okay, just tough it out. If you have a stop in place, let your stop get taken out. I know easier said than done, <laughs> especially for me who drops a lot of F-bombs. Let's take a look at the Rusty. The Rusty remains the rub. Notice that it's down eh, more than a third of a percent today. I guess round numbers half percent if you round it up. It's kind of wide and loose and just can't seem to get through this prior little peak in here or prior peaks in here. So that's a little bit of a concern. I wouldn't get too excited just yet as long as the S&P and NASDAQ are hanging in, there, hanging in there. But I sure would like to see this Rusty join the party. Now in the sectors, some areas have been waking up in here today notwithstanding like gold you could see been waking up a little bit more specifically the silver stocks which are a little bit more volatile they've been kind of taken off as of late today notwithstanding and they're pushing back towards these old highs even though they look like they were rolling over not that long ago so that's certainly a good thing some areas like drugs which were wide and loose and all over the place have now decided to finally join in the party, at least with the S&P and NASDAQ, that is, and break out. So wide and loose all over the place. I wouldn't get too excited about them just yet, but at least they're breaking out like the overall market. Retail, another one of those areas kind of hanging in there, not really setting the world on fire, but just off of all time high. So let's give it the benefit of the doubt, at least for now. One of my big concerns with a market when it's bouncing around 
its prior peaks and it finally breaks out. If it doesn't break out too decisively, in other words, if it doesn't go a long ways, then one or two big bad day, one or two big, one or two bad days put you back into the soup. And as you can see, the transports, we had a down day. Yesterday, pretty ugly day. Now we're back into the sideways range. Not the end of the world. Obviously, one big update puts you back in, back towards new highs, but that hasn't happened yet. Well, it's only one day in. Some of these other areas which haven't done too well, as you know, we I just showed that PAGS trade, which is software. And that was put in put on back in September when software was looking a little bit uglier. You can see it looked like a major top was in place. Kind of a head and shoulders top. By the way, when a bearish pattern is broken, that's actually kind of a bullish thing, okay? But you can see so far so good in software today notwithstanding, but it's pushed its way higher on a fairly persistent basis all the way back to its prior peak in here. Let's take a look at bonds. Now bonds had a decent rally yesterday. Today they're off a little bit. It's a bumpy ride because bonds are a very efficient market. A lot of players in the bond market, hedgers and all kinds of people, and they tend to cancel each other out. And the hedgers tend to make the absolute worst traders. And by hedgers, I mean people that have to buy or sell bonds. They just go in and do it. They just don't really try to time the market or anything. And that could really wreak havoc. But for the most part, we're making lower highs. I guess that's probably the easiest way of looking at it since the peak that we made back in September. So bonds look like they could be in trouble still. Let's take a look at the dollar. Dollar still looks like a top is in place here. Not a bad day, but it still looks kind of toppy. Until and unless I wanted to make new highs, I wouldn't get too excited about the dollar. The significance with the dollar topping and becoming weak or weaker is that gold and the metals and then possibly even the energies or definitely the energies too could get a bid based on that so we could see some action or more action in the commodities right now we're long AUY it hasn't really paid off just yet let's take a look at that in the golds and we're down a little bit today and it's just kind of meandering it was beautiful back here look at that TKO I feel like tiny Elvis Look at that lamp, it's huge. Look at that TKO right there, beautiful. And boy, it looked like it was off to the races. I was feeling like a genius. Went sideways, took off again. Hey, look, dead money report. And then now sideways again. Dave, why don't you get out? It's going sideways. Nope, I'm gonna follow the plan. I have a stop in place. And because I made a public declaration on that, I'm gonna keep that stop in place. All right, let's go ahead and open up for any individual issues. The bottom line is overall the market's looking okay for now. Continue to follow along. The thing is, I'm not seeing a lot of setups, and that's because the methodology requires a pullback. And until and unless you have a pullback in the overall market, which we haven't seen much of just yet, you're not going to see a lot of setups. But eventually we will when the market pulls back. Maybe tonight we'll see quite a few setups. I have people all the time that try to time my core trading service. And as a general statement, that's usually a bad idea because I never know when the next big winner is going to come along. People wait and wait and wait. And usually somewhere in that waiting period, we have a bunch of stocks trigger and then we go back to sitting on our hands. And right now, the portfolio is looking pretty good. But we're back to sitting on our hands as far as new positions. But we could have a few any day since the market's beginning to pull back a little bit. All right. Any Stocks you guys want me to take a look at? I think the Facebook group has probably helped a lot here because we do talk a lot of, about a lot of stocks there, but it, going once, going twice. All right. Well, as usual, I want to thank everybody for coming. I appreciate you taking time on a busy schedule. Any unanswered questions, you know to retain Dave at DaveLander.com or DaveLander.com slash contact. Everybody have a great weekend. Oh, no show next week. It's Thanksgiving. Everybody enjoy Thanksgiving to you guys who are watching from across the pond, or ponds, I should say. Happy Thursday. <laughs> again, everybody have a great Thanksgiving. We will talk again in two weeks. Thank you so much.